Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. It's episode 50, so I reckon that calls for a little bit of a celebration. <laughs> uh, anyway, the big thing that happened this week was probably the launch of the NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1660. You can check out Steve's review of that card yesterday. Uh, I did read some comments about the pricing data that we used in that video. As always, that data does change rapidly and we made that video a week in advance. So Steve could go on holiday, so naturally prices did change a little bit, but not really enough to significantly alter the conclusion. For example, the GTX 1660 is still a better buy at $220 than a $190 RX 580, which is, I guess, the typical price right now, aside from that one card on a limited time discount. At that price, both cards are about the same value, but the GTX 1660 is a decent amount faster, so it's probably worth spending the extra $30 or so to get the faster product. The RX 590 at as low as $220 also isn't quite cutting it given it's the same price as the MSRP for the 1660, yet it's slower on average. And I think Steve will have more on this in a bigger benchmark video next week. On to the news stories of the week. This one came as a big surprise for the gaming community. DirectX 12 is now available on Windows 7. In fact, is that a good reason to use another one of these? I've got a few still remaining. I mean, you know, why not? Since the launch of DX12, it has only been available on Windows 10, which has been a problem for developers as many gamers are still using Windows 7. This effectively meant that any developer that wanted to use DX12 also had to create a DX11 version for gamers that refused to upgrade to Microsoft's latest OS. Today, that's no longer the case. Microsoft said they have ported the user mode D3D12 runtime to Windows 7, which unblocks developers who want to take full advantage of the latest improvements in D3D12 while still supporting customers on older operating systems. However, it's not a situation where all DX12 games will now magically run on Windows 7. Instead, each game will need an update to support the ported D3D12 runtime for Windows 7. Presumably, supporting this runtime is a lot easier than supporting an entirely separate DX11 version. The first game to make use of this is World of Warcraft with the latest 8.1.5 game patch. Microsoft says they are working with other developers to port their DX12 games to Windows 7. They also claim that due to critical OS improvements, DirectX 12 games will still run better in Windows 10, which might be something we should benchmark. To be honest, I find Microsoft's reasoning for now suddenly supporting DirectX 12 Windows 7 a bit amusing. They say, at Microsoft, we make every effort to respond to customer feedback. So when we receive this feedback from Blizzard and other developers, developers, we decided to act on it. I find it a bit hard to believe that Microsoft has only just now received this feedback, given Windows 10 is nearly four years old, and the lack of DX12 support in Windows 7 has been a major complaint for gamers that don't care for Windows 10 at all. From one angle, the timing is also a bit strange, given Windows 7 will hit an end of support state in January 2020. On the other hand, Microsoft was clearly using DirectX 12 as an incentive to get gamers to upgrade to Windows 10. There really hasn't been a genuine technical reason why DirectX 12 wouldn't work with Windows 7. It has always been an artificial limitation to make Windows 10 more attractive. But at this point, four years after launch, I think Microsoft believed that anyone that was going to upgrade to Windows 10 has done so by now. The remaining Windows 7 users probably aren't going to upgrade anytime soon, given they've had plenty of time to do so, which really makes the upgrade incentive unnecessary now. With so many developers releasing dual DX11, DX12 games, there also hasn't been much of an incentive to upgrade to access specific games. So at this point, the best thing for developers and the best thing overall is simply to foster DX12 adoption and make it available to all gamers. Hopefully this will drive better DX12 implementations because there are still plenty of games where the DX11 mode runs better. So yeah, this is pretty big news for those on Windows 7. Both AMD and Nvidia say that with their latest drivers, DirectX 12 should work in Windows 7 with World of Warcraft. It will be interesting to see what other games will get updated with Windows 7 support. Some titles like Shadow of the Tomb Raider that perform a lot better in the DX12 mode would be prime candidates. The other big story from this week is that Nvidia has bought Mellanox for 6.9 billion US dollars. Earlier reports suggest both Intel and Nvidia were in the race to purchase the company with Intel offering around 6 billion. Nvidia's bid was larger, so it won the race and the acquisition should complete at the end of the year. So what do Mellanox do? Well, they are a data center networking company, so not really related to the usual stuff we cover on this channel. 
We're talking about, you know, network switches and hardware for enterprises, connectivity tech and all that sort of stuff that's usually only seen in the background. With NVIDIA making big pushes into the data center with their GPU products, acquiring Mellanox allows them to also provide other hardware for those projects. This is an all cash deal, NVIDIA is paying $125 per share, so around 14% above the previous closing price. We probably won't hear too much more about Mellanox for a while, given we are mostly interested in NVIDIA's consumer GPUs, but it does add to their growing portfolio of products nicely. AMD has quietly launched the Radeon RX 560 XT for the Chinese market. The XT brand was famously used for many of AMD's older products back in the Radeon HD era, so it's nice to see that make a little bit of a comeback here. The GPU itself is a pretty interesting product as well. The RX 560 XT is much closer to an RX 570 than an RX 560, but it isn't either of those GPUs, so it's not a straight rebrand of those cards. It seems to be a cut down RX 570, which itself is a cut down Polaris 20 die. What we're left with is 1792 stream processors, down from the 2048 in the RX 570, but much higher than the 1024 in the RX 560 non-XT. We're also looking at the same 256-bit GD the R5 bus as the RX 570 rather than the 128-bit bus used in the RX 560. Clock speeds are lower than both the RX 560 and 570 with a 973 MHz base and 1073 MHz boost along with 6.6 gigabit per second memory. However, this still makes it much faster than an RX 560 but a decent amount below an RX 570 according to AMD's benchmarks. While it is a China-only product, you would still expect pricing to fit between the RX 570 and RX 560 as well, so probably around the equivalent of $120 given a $100 RX 560 and $140 RX 570. As Video Cards notes, while this isn't a dodgy rebrand of the RX 560 to RX 570, this does look like just a slightly different version of the also China-exclusive RX 470D. I guess there really isn't all that much more you can do with Polaris Silicon these days. The Halo Master Chief Collection is coming to PC, and in a surprise move from Microsoft, is coming to Steam as well as the Windows Store. Hopefully this is a bit of a strategy shift for Microsoft. There have been a few murmurings that suggest Microsoft is going to take a more open approach to games rather than trying to lock down everything as an exclusive. We'll probably find out more about that with their next generation of consoles. But this move to release Halo on Steam rather than the awful Microsoft Store could be the early beginnings of this. It'll also benefit gamers and Microsoft Pockets because plenty of PC gamers refuse to buy anything from the Microsoft Store. Sure, Microsoft would love people buying stuff from their own store exclusively, but the reality is offering games on a wide variety of platforms, including those that are popular with games like Steam, can lead to increased sales and lower piracy. Fingers crossed Microsoft continue to take this approach with their other game releases. As for the Master Chief Collection itself, this will be the first time that several Halo games will come to PC, including Halo 3, Halo 3 ODST, Halo Reach, and Halo 4. The collection also includes the original Halo and Halo 2, with Halo Reach new to the collection overall. 343 Industries is going to stagger the release, so buyers will receive the games in chronological order, starting with Reach, then moving through Combat Evolved, Halo 2, and so on. There will also be support for PC standard features such as custom resolutions, aspect ratios, frame rates, and so on. The first of NVIDIA's big format gaming displays is now here in the HP Omen X Imperium. These massive TV slash gaming display things were first announced at CES 2018, so it's taken a little while for them to become available, but HP is now selling theirs for a super high $5,000 US price tag. The display itself is a 65-inch 4K AMVA panel that refreshes up to 144Hz and fully supports HDR with up to 1000 nits of peak brightness, a 384 zone FALD backlight and 95% DCI-P3 coverage. It also has a G-Sync module inside, a native contrast ratio of 4000 to 1 and four millisecond response times with overdrive, and there's a soundbar included. Comparing this display to regular PC monitors does make it look pretty impressive. You get proper HDR support. 4K at up to 144Hz, G-Sync, and so on, and it's 65 inches. But the comparison isn't as favorable up against modern TVs. Samsung, for example, will sell you a high-end 65-inch Q90 QLED TV for 3500 US, which packs a 4K resolution up to 120Hz, FreeSync, and excellent HDR. You don't get G-Sync, but it's overall a lot cheaper, and LG's flagship OLED TVs as well offer more features for less money. I am interested to test one of these guys to see what they're like, but Fortunately, at this point, I haven't had much success securing a review unit. I also suspect there will be a super niche product for games that specifically want a TV-sized display with G-Sync and a 144Hz refresh rate. 
And I think that Nvidia's lack of support for adaptive sync over HDMI is biting them a little bit here, given what TVs are doing and ones that are coming to the market right now. Final topic for this week, Acer has launched a 49-inch ultra-wide gaming monitor called the EI491CR. It's a 32.9 VA panel at 3840 by 1080, so a double-wide 1080p. It has a 144 Hz refresh rate and FreeSync 2 support through Display HDR 400 certification. That said, without proper local dimming, this isn't really an HDR display. It's nice to see more of these high refresh super ultra wides hit the market. Uh, this one will cost $900 and should become available in the next few months. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, subscribe to get this segment in your inbox weekly. Consider supporting us on Patreon to get access to our Discord community and I'll catch you in the next one.